Good evening, everyone, and welcome. My name is Tika, and I help run events here at The Strand. Before we will launch into a discussion of Chris Herring's new book, Blood in the Garden, The Flagrant History of the 1990s New York Knicks, I'd like to share a little bit of history about The Strand. The Strand was founded in 1927 by Benjamin Bass on Fourth Avenue's book, book row, stretching from Union Square to Astor Place, Brookwell gradually dwindled from 48 bookstores until after 94 years, The Strand is the sole survivor and run by third generation owner, Nancy Bass Whiten. We would want to thank all of you for your support. Without a loyal community of book lovers and authors, we wouldn't be here today. We are thrilled to have Chris Herring with us for a discussion of his new book, Blood in the Garden, the flagrant history of the 1990s New York Knicks. Chris Herring is a senior writer for Sports Illustrated. He previously spent five years covering the NBA for ESPN and 538, and prior to that, spent seven years at the Wall Street Journal, where he covered the New York Knicks. He lives in Chicago and teaches at Northwestern's Middle School of Journalism in his spare time. Joining Chris in conversation is Spike Lee. Spike Lee is a Knicks fan. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming Chris and Spike to the stage. What's up? What's going on, Spike? How are you, man? Orange and blue sky. <laughs> it wasn't until the other day you texted me, and I'm like, this is just a, it's almost like an email signature that you have with the orange and blue skies now. Well, yeah. Disappointing, two losses in a row, both at home. I don't know. I'm going to phrase. The struggle continues. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, that's why I gave you all the book. Y'all can kind of relax in the nostalgia. The long, long suffering Nick fans. <laughs> but uh, a friend of mine, we both share a friend. And she hit me, you were in high school, mm -hmm. and, and, and she hit me to this book, said, my friend wrote this book about the Knicks, and I think you should. I'm like, what? So I, we had not talked. So I, I, I found out who was the publisher, <laughs> found out who was the police department, and I got a book. You went into uh, reporting mode. Advanced report, I mean, excuse me, advanced copy, I got a book. <laughs> and then, you know, we got hooked up, so uh, it's just been a, the book is a revelation. I don't think you have to be a, a Knicks fan or a basketball fan to enjoy the cast of characters <laughs> that this time period deals with, with the glorious Nick team. Now, my, the first, see, I'm older than you, so I was 13 years old for the, the Willis Reed, Paul Frazier, Dick Barnett, Dave DeBush, Bill Bradley, Bill Hoskett, Donnie May, you know, Coach, Brent Holtzman. So that was the first great team, which won two world championships. Right. The 69-70 team and the 72-73 team. And so the Knicks have not won, have not won a world championship this 72-73 season. Right. How many years is that? 40. I should be better at math than this. You put me on the spot for all these people. But uh, <laughs> this this team. Yeah. I mean, you really, I tell people all the time, you can't use the word if in sports. Mm -hmm. If somebody, the ball didn't roll the bump in his leg, Scott Norwood did not miss four field goals, you know, but, but this team, this hard, you know, first of all, we had, you know, you had Michael Jordan. Yeah, he was pretty good. The GOAT. <laughs> the GOAT. To me, two GOATs. Now look, I'm not hitting anybody, but Ali and Jordan, to me, okay. are the GOATs. So, this book, ladies and gentlemen, is really bring, bringing back a lot of fond memories, you know, and heartache. I was right up in it, you know, I was uh, right there at Courtside, the world's most famous arena. And I do a lot of stuff, but the stuff you got in this book, you 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 dig some, you did some dig some, you were digging, <laughs> you know, you dug. Thank you. And so it was, a, you know, it was enlightening to see all the, the stuff that was going behind the scenes, especially in the front office. You know, power plays and this and that, and 
backstabbing and <laughs> in, intrigue. So I recommend this book for, for everybody. I appreciate you reading that. Uh, what he was saying, one of my high school, I know I've got a lot of high school friends watching tonight. Um, and Tia Dillard, who I didn't even know worked for you. Um, got, I guess she must have seen me. I guess it pays to retweet your own stuff and to tweet people's pictures of the book. But she put it, kind of brought it to your attention. And I guess you kind of sent her out there to go find it. So I'm happy that she connected us. Um, but no, I'm not probably found out the book came out till right today. And it probably felt like a betrayal. New Times. <laughs> it probably felt like a betrayal that you're like, wait, a next book came out. I didn't know about it. Uh, hey, you know, you were doing that undercover. <laughs> well, I appreciate you reading it. It was a, a joy to write this thing, man. Um, I know it's weird. I knew we just let's 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 start at the beginning. Sure. Origin. How did this come about? I wish I could be like, you know, it was a, a foggy night. And no, the, the literary agent hit me and said, we know that this will be a hit. We know a lot of people what, care about what this. they said. What would be a hit? Say, can you... the, the, the Knicks of the 90s, specifically because of what you just said. It, you said, how long has it been? It's been a while. And, you know, I think there have been a last 5, 10, 15 years now between the Red Sox and the Cubs and LeBron and the Cavs, it's, it's been a while for a lot of franchises, but there's like this emotional outpouring whenever you get a team that finally kind of reaches the mountaintop or when you get a team that hasn't oh, gotten that was they did then was it nineteen oh eight? I know. And the Red Sox was nineteen eighteen. The saddest thing, man. I'm I'm from Chicago, so I I mean there were people they were putting radios in the cemetery, like so that their parents, grandparents, great grandparents could hear you know, the game seven or game, what is it? Yeah, game seven in the baseball and the Cubs were playing the Indians. It's like, man, it, it, it runs deep. And I know for a fact it hasn't been that long for the Knicks, but it's been long enough to where people have been just waiting and waiting. You don't waiting. think the, the, the second world championship team with 72, 73 is not a long time? No, no, no. I'm just saying it hasn't been like Cubs long, but half Cubs long, which is still long yeah, enough. Yeah, they were in professional <laughs> NBA in 1908. Right. <laughs> so maybe it would have been that long. But uh, no, I, I I knew, I I was I was very close to saying no to the offer to do the book. I did say no once. Why did you say no? Because, you know, it wasn't my original idea. I, I think I was telling you, you know, my dad passed uh, a couple months before this. I was still trying to work through that mentally, spiritually. Uh, I had a day job that keeps me busy enough. I was teaching on top of that. Um, and really, I knew it would be a lot of work. Like you said, you dug and you dug and you dug. It's a lot of work. And it's it's not, you can't. But hold up, hold up, yeah. hold up, hold up, hold up. Because I don't want the audience to think that because something's going to be hard, something's going to take a lot of work, that, that, that you should run away from that. So why don't you fix this up? Okay. <laughs> It was gonna. There might be some young children watching <laughs> that we don't want to give them the we, thing we that you run away from away. hard work. <laughs> it was gonna be hard work, regardless of when I wrote the book, how I wrote the book, and what better project to do hard work on something than something that people are so passionate about it that well, someone in your well, me too, but someone in your position is gonna <laughs> look up and see that there's a book on it and send the assistant out the same moment. You know, go get that for me. And re tell them. I mean, you you told me this. The Knicks. I mean, y'all know where Spike is any night that the Knicks have a home game. He's gonna be right there where he always is. It was a Wednesday night on the a night where the Knicks had a game. You sent Tia out to go get the book. Not Tia. It was. Oh, you didn't send her out to go get the book. Tia's in Chicago. Well, okay. So you sent somebody out to get the book. My office in Brooklyn. Oh, okay. I thought Tia was here. No, okay. No, no, All right. Chicago. Well, so it was. A, so it was. You sent someone to go get the book. And Simon and Schuster. To Simon and Schuster, and, and on a night where the Knicks played, I, you called me Thursday morning, and I'm like, how, how are you calling me, giving me a clip notes on my own book? He had already read it, even though the Knicks played the night before. I mean, you read it in one day, in like two sittings, because it is you. Is it page turn? Well, I appreciate that, but it that to me, I would get the other thing too. There's something that you hold yourself accountable when you're writing a book because. You know, my, my uh, publisher, my agent were like, you got to tell people that you're working on the book now. I was like, why am I announcing it now if it's not going to be ready for two years? B 
because you've got to put you got to put the shark repellent out there. Don't let anybody else do the book. You've got it now. And I was like, okay. And it was funny, but once you put it out there that you're doing it, it's like an accountability thing because everybody knows you're working on it. So I I couldn't go a week, two days, three days without saying. I, you know, I'm tweeting about Breaking Bad. I'm tweeting about watching The Sopranos. Are you done with the book yet, sir? You know, like I'm getting that tweet from everybody. It's like your parents asking whether you're done with your homework when you're just having any level of enjoyment. It must be what basketball players feel like when they tweet about anything. They're like, wait, you, you're not a good free throw shooter. Why aren't you in the gym? So that was the feeling I had, but it's holding you accountable constantly. And that was motivation too. the fan base, just people that want to read my work, that want something to do. We were all rushing people to finish the last dance. So we got something to watch during the pandemic. This was the same thing for me. And today, the book came out today, right? It came out yesterday. Yesterday, Tuesday, right? Yes, sir. How's the reception been so far? Um, I, I, I didn't think I would. I had tears in my eyes yesterday. Um, what? How so? Do tell. <laughs> Were they tears or tears? Um, no, you know, I, I, I've told you about my parents, man. And um, when I said no, I was getting over the passing of my dad. And he, he there were two things that he was really excited about in, in those last few years. Uh, he was a professor, a sociology professor. Where at? At a couple schools. Uh, he was mostly at uh, UIC, University of Illinois at Chicago, and then uh, the last job he took, he retired from UIC and went to UMBC. You remember the team that knocked off Virginia in the tournament, the 16th seed, uh, at the University of Maryland, Baltimore County. And he he knew I was about to start teaching, and I had started teaching at Northwestern. He was super proud of what that. What were you teaching? What's that? What were you teaching? Uh, are you teaching? Graduate school journalism at, at Northwestern, and he was super proud of that. He was helping me with, put together my syllabus for my students. But then the other thing, too, that he always was excited about, he he knew I was going to do a book at some point. And he, he would send me these ideas, sometimes not very good ideas, for books and everything. And so I know he would have been excited about that. But did he know about you, right? I mean, before he made his transition, God uh, bless him, did he know about the Nick book? No, no, no. It was right. It was months after that. And that was why I initially said no. Part of the reason I said no. Okay, I but uh, I know he... I'm thinking the chronological. Order. Sure. So he would have been really proud. And uh, I know my mom would have been. What's up? Chicago Bulls fan? No, no, no. You, Oof, this will run deep. He was, I told you he went to University of Houston. I was born in Houston. My dad grew up in Texas, so might have been a Rockets fan. Like, yeah. But he was but he was one of those guys that adopted whatever city he lived in. So Bulls, he, he liked the Texas teams. I took him to the NBA Finals, the clincher, and uh, was that 14 when uh, the Spurs beat LeBron and then LeBron went to Miami? Um, we were there for that. He touched the trophy, almost grabbed the trophy out of Tony Parker's arms. And the elevator security guard almost punched my dad. Uh, but anyway, <laughs> he he and my mom would have been really proud. My sister, the day that you and I connected, um, I guess the day before you and I connected, you posted an Instagram post of, of the book, and she saw it, and she called me. She was a I, she follows me. Uh, apparently, <laughs> I'm not even really big on Instagram, so she she saw that. And she she just started she crying. Up. She called me just what thinking about what she said. She said. Mom and dad, then that she just was a, a, a waterworks. But she was just saying, this is, we ask ourselves, I think a lot of people have lost their parents, ask themselves like, am I doing enough? Uh, and you want your parents to know that they did well. And uh, this is one of those things, where like, this week has been just super I'm happy overwhelming. for you and it's well deserved because just, you did the damn thing, baby, you did it. Thank you, man. Co-sign from you. I mean, you're like I said, you're Knicks fan number one, man. So thank you. I really appreciate that. But it's been a it's been an overwhelming week, and, a, and, and just so much gratitude I've got for everybody that's watching, that's ordered. <laughs> the event organizer here is telling me, like, you know, that they're in the process of getting more books in because they've been selling so many of them, they can't keep them on the shelves. That's just a emotionally, that's just overwhelming sometimes. But it's I'm grateful. Well, I think that it's two things. I think that it, it is is your artistry as a writer. And also, this Nick team is beloved. Yeah. And I'm not, you know, people, my wife and I, we've been married 29 years, and so we don't have these discussions more, but I always tell her that the reason why I read the sports page first is because everything that's happened in the world has come through sports. A lot of them. 
So I I go to the Daily News and the Post. I just read the Post for the sports section. But <laughs> but to think that sports is just some men playing games or women, but but so much change in the world has happened through sports. Yeah. I mean, fundamental change. Where would the world be without a Jackie Roberts, or, you know, or, or Billie Jean King, or, or Muhammad Ali? We go on and on and on of people, great athletes, but also who are more than an athlete and use their platform to try to kind of change, you know, various, you know, not just United States of America, but all, all over the world. So I never, I got this from my father, you know, who, Love sports. That uh, it's not just games, you know. It's 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 special, and and, and I know that people might, you know, the fan was fan comes to the word fanatic, fanatic. Yep. And and if you, if you don't follow sports, it's hard to understand how. Fans' relationship between a city, the high school, college, whatever, but fan and their team. Mm -hmm. And even though, for example, I mean, Cup fans are, you know, they're great. The Cubbies, you know, Wrigley Field, you know, they were terrible for years. Terrible. Horrible. But that's your team. My best friend could relate with that. It's That's your team. Up, yeah. And and the same thing with the Knicks, you know. People were asking me, like, when the Nets moved to Brooklyn, you know, the Barclays Center is four blocks away from my office. Did they try to recruit you to be a Nets fan when they were doing that whole branding thing with, with Jay-Z? No, they and tried it when, when <laughs> uh, the owner of the Knicks. Asked, oh, they came after you. <laughs> and they were like, the next day. They came in the well, living room. You, you come up with our Instagram, his Instagram, you know, playing. We were, you're down the block, be a Nets fan. I can't, <laughs> like I said before, the Barkson's four blocks away from right. my office. I can't do it. I have no beef with the Nets. KD. Love them guys. Harden. Kyrie. Make them ball. I love that jersey too. It says Ben Stop. I got I told him Kate he owns me. He said he's gonna give me a game worn. <laughs> Did you see them when it says Ben Stop? Do it not. But I can't do it. Yeah. I grew up with I was 10, I was at the garden. May 8th, 1970. Game seven. The Wolves regame. I was there. 10 years old, go free. Growing up in New York City, here's my guys. Willie Mays, Willie Mays, Walt Frazier, Joe Namath, Joe Willie, and Ali. And, and to be honest, I got to meet all these people too. I was a little knucklehead, nappy headed kid running the streets in Brooklyn. And yeah. not even, and then I get to meet these people who well, I were my heroes. That's just crazy, you know? Why, why did how did this squad resonate with you? I'm curious. Because I mean you and I talked I about mean, this it's, it's my it's my childhood and adulthood. Uh -huh. You know early on I said Lord if I ever make any money, <laughs> I want to buy a brownstone in Fort Green where I grew up. I want to buy a house in Mars Vineyard. <laughs> and I want to get season tickets from the New York Knickerbockers. And in this book, you wrote that story <laughs> about the night the Knicks. It's still today, it's still controversial. Very. How the Knicks, how come you didn't go with them? We'll talk about it later. Yeah. But anyway, <laughs> the Knicks got no more pick. 
Hatch fuel. Yeah. And I was walking with my girlfriend. And as soon as, I mean, she probably wanted me to tell me that day, but she at least gave me enough love that she dropped the bomb. <laughs> She, she, she broke over with me. She waited to the next, to the first pick. <laughs> so she knew what I would be so dumb, Sean. And then I got the axe. She broke and up then, with you right after Patrick Ewing basically became a nigga. And wild. the next morning, I was online. Tickets went on sale. The next morning, 6 a.m. I was at like 4 a.m. And that's, so I've had season tickets since Patrick Ewing's. For a year, and so every year, I just move down. And that's the dream, right? Of the court. That's that's the I dream. I mean, growing up, I was sitting in the blue seats, right. Mass Square Garden. They call it the Blue Heaven. You know, your SGO card, high school. I didn't care. I was in the last row. I just glad. I was just glad to be in the world's most famous arena and cheer on my team. Right. I mean, all this stuff, I was, I, I mean, I didn't know I wanted to be a filmmaker until the summer between my sophomore, juniors, and Morehouse College. So, I mean, just to, I mean, to sit, and also, I'm not going to brag, but until you sit, look, I'm blessed. I understand that. And those tickets cost a lot of money. But when you sit courtside, at the garden? Yeah. You gave me a sure. taste of that a couple of days ago. It's it's, it's not bad. Of course I had the garden <laughs> and it's bad. rocking. <laughs> oh, I'm telling you, when the garden is rocking, playoffs. Yeah. You can feel the building sink, but it is is this what I mean it is bananas. But that was a jealousy I had in writing the book. And it, it I don't think it's the way I wrote it. I think it's. I, you I, were I said born. This, I was. I was I mean, old. You were old. I, 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 and I'm, you were Chicago too. I was in Chicago. They back hated back. Chicago Bulls. I, I was. I, I wasn't part of that. I care. But here's the thing: watching the YouTube stuff, which is a really powerful research tool for something like this, by the way, to just see how physically. I, I keep using the word phys- the phrase physically oppressive this team was defensively, and how they hit people. Watching and, the YouTube and, stuff and, of and the, the NBA had to change the rules. They, they had to change the rules, and and the thing that gets me when I'm, I don't have a damn who wins. I'm not a Knicks fan. I'm not a Bulls fan at this point. I was as a kid. The watching the starting lineups and just how loud the crowd is. I I get goosebumps watching the starting lineup introductions from the '90s and just watching the pageantry of it. Too. Chicago, oh, Chicago was great Chicago, too. Chicago. But I feel this it, it, the energy in the the arenas back. With the seat upgrades and everything else, so there's not the intimacy that there was. Sweets. The sweets. There's there's so much money in it. So sometimes you lose some of that electricity that you would have felt back then. But I'm glad they didn't knock down the guard and just went in. Yeah, yeah. Like I don't know. I I, I wish I could have experienced that. And there, I I, I do wonder. Can't, you can't choose when you're born. Yeah, you know, that's when you're born. You're born. Yeah. That's like well, if so and so this player was born in another and played another era. Why even do that? <laughs> you're born, you're born. I only hear a well, well, if so and so played in this certain era, he would not. It, it, it don't work like that. You're born, when you're born. And that's why, and I agree with Michael Jordan, who says, gee, Mike's very smart. And he's really tried to stay afloat in this whole who's the goat stuff. And Mike, you know, MJ, he said, it's different errors. You can't compare. And, you know, he said, I'm not getting that argument. He didn't have to. He didn't have to. <laughs> he, that, well, that number well, one, he, yes. he didn't have to, but number two, it helps to drop a ten part documentary and let that be your freestyle on it and not have to not have drop. to Right. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. But those don't know exactly. it's called dropping a mic. <laughs> dropping a motherfucking mic. <laughs> Why are you a best man? <laughs> All I can say is I got six rings. Right. There doesn't have to be much. It works. It works. It works. It doesn't have to be a breaking the mic, dropping the mic. <laughs> you got six rings. Yeah. And 
never lost. I so that was probably the question. The finals are never lost. The question I got from the people, and the question I still get, a lot of people will tweet me and say, should I buy this book? Do I need to buy this book? I'm not a Knicks fan. Will I enjoy this book? You said, you, I think you could be a basketball fan and like it. I don't think you have to be a Knicks fan, but I think that, oh, man, it, it, just to come real quick. Yeah. Even if you hate the Knicks, and I know a lot of people in the end of it. Sure. Chicago and Boston. Buy the book. And, and LA, because the Knicks were there. Yeah. I mean, they were there. And that's the thing. And that's the Just thing. Just can you know, can do it at home. Because if I think they're there, and I think this was the NBA's hope, and I don't think Michael cared about it, but I think the NBA's hope with the last dance is that there were so many people I would see. I follow a lot of fans just to understand what I should be writing about, what they care about. And they were like, damn, Michael was kind of good. Like, I didn't know he was like that. Well, those are, I think those are people who are too young. Right, of course. And that's my point is that I and that's what, got to see Michael play. That's what I hope comes across in the book a little bit is that there's so many people that are of the mindset that like, well, why should I care about something that doesn't involve a team that won a championship or that even if they got close, they didn't win it. But the thing is, when this is the argument, I guess I'm not making an argument, but I think you can kind of read between the lines of what's in the book. Hey, can I just of course. I'll give it for an example? One of the greatest sports books ever written. One of the greatest sports books ever written by Roger Kahn. The Boys of Summer about the Brooklyn Dodgers. The only once one in 55 every year, you know, losing to the Yankees. They hated Yankees. Mm -hmm. And just the character of those. Jackie Robinson, Campanella, Joe Blatt, Duke Snyder, Carl Farrillo, Pee Wee Reese. I mean, the characters, because it's human beings who are playing this game. Right. They're not robots, and everybody's not the same. And when you get this, you know, for me, what makes great teams are the characters where you have the mixture of the seasoned veterans mm -hmm. with the youth. The Lakers example of a team that's old as fuck. No disrespect. <laughs> They're old. They're all real old. No disrespect. <laughs> hey, look, I'm 63, so 64 with me. I'm old. So old. And if you look at Gold State. They got them. They got them, them young boys. Them young. You guys are killing. They go along with them. Clay you Clay know, Clay. Stephon and that plays back and brother man who's out now. Kramer. Yeah, great. So it's that mixture. And also people come from different backgrounds, even all the black. I mean, even, even just because it, it is all black, I mean, everybody's from the hood. Or there's different, you know, first of all, black people not one mile with the group. And if motherfuckers can't get along and somehow find like, like, put all the bullshit aside, we got to come together. We got to win this motherfucker. That's where greatness comes, where whatever the differences are, whatever beast people got, that shit got me squashed. And you got to have like, motherfucker like Michael Jordan say, yo, Fuck the bullshit. We're trying to win. <laughs> so I don't want to hear it. We got to win. So all that petty shit that you motherfuckers are doing, I'm not having it. And you got to have the alpha dog like, yo, we're rolling like this. And like, you know, let's go. I want to ask you, based on what you were saying <laughs> about these guys, you, you've you said before, you've been on record saying Starks was your guy. Sorry, you wear his jersey. You no, no, no. Patrick's my guy. Okay. But think about it, but I only wear game worn jerseys. Oh, I didn't know that. And a Patrick Ewing game worn it's a jersey. Big ass jersey on you. He would come down. <laughs> he would come, I got a frame now, but it'll come down right above my Jordan. You and a couple friends could fit in there. <laughs> so Okay. Starks. I mean Starks my guy too. Starks. Was responsible for me not moving from New York right. City. Well, I figured game that. six in Indiana. Okay, because that's what I was going to ask you. Was because game five, I was on 
The morning after game five falls on front page of New Newsday now defunct. The post and daily news. I was on the front page. Yeah. Being blamed for the Knicks losing. Yeah. And nobody thought the Knicks were gonna win game six in Indiana. Yeah. The Starks save, as my mother, my late mother would say, she saved my narrow black ass. What do you hit? Five, five threes that game or something like that? No, we came in the fourth quarter. Yeah, just kill it. Because Usher's late in the game, Usher's surround the court with rope to keep people from storming mm -hmm. the court. Yeah. That that was bad. Uh that that, that atmosphere. And it was crazy because I, I mean, in the book I said that I'd never been to a clan rally, but that was close to it. Right. And the and the crazy <laughs> thing is that I planned I planned to quote that all along, but I was like, I gotta find something to was, kind of corrupt. I said that in the in, uh, in the documentary. Reggie Miller versus New York. Right, you said it in the doc. So I knew you'd said it, but I'm like, all right, I wanna try to go a little that was what I was trying to do with the book in a lot of spots is there's stuff out there, but let me try to go one level deeper because there's been so much stuff about the Knicks are about those rivalries. And so in that case, it was something simple, but you read it. And Jay Adande essentially said, no, I saw Spike coming out of the restaurant. I saw them calling him the N-word. -word. So it was pretty visceral. Yeah. It was pretty nasty. I mean, that's and, obviously. And that, you know, in the end, is really just a shock. The plan was found in India. So it was like, Digga. Man, you, you lucky. <laughs> If they had us on ESPN, man, they're going to commercial break. <laughs> but we're on ESPN. No, I said if we oh. were on ESPN, no, no. the Strand. Y'all, y'all are wrong with Strand. NC seventeen. Um, oh, I got caught, and and the, and the players will tell you they heard it. You go to Boston, and we know what they did to Patrick when he was in high school. Pretty ugly, real ugly. Patrick put up signs. Can you read this? You know that kind of stuff. So. Now they don't today the players don't play that. But back in the day, you 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 would think that your nickname was the N-word. If you go into Boston, you go into uh Indiana, Utah too. The Jazz. Yeah. Come on now. Yeah. Them guys, you don't tell you. Yeah. It's sad though, because you get people that'll deny it and they'll say, I haven't heard it. Okay, but why would they have said it to you? You know, the way the fan base looks, like you're not going to hear it if you're not someone of that background. You know, the players would know. And the players have literally no reason to make that stuff up. But yeah, there was there was a lot of that. And, and part of what, it's it wasn't that long ago, but part of what I noticed, too, in reporting the book out, and this has come out in the Mouths of the Palace documentary. We've, we've been talking about that a little bit. I watched it. Um, how loosely people called folks thugs. Like, you couldn't be a physical team back then without being called a thug. Um, it was just... It, Came off people's lips really easily back then, off their tongues really easily. Oh, look, it started. God rest, God rest his soul. You know, David Stern, Ian Brush, and Alan Iverson's tattoos off the, the the League magazine, whatever it was. Yeah. And uh, rap, gangsters, violence. You know, it's that whole narrative. Yeah. And the fact that the league, uh, the dress code, you go oh, down. The dress code was definitely. Oh, my goodness. Kind of, you know, that was like. Carmelo and I would talk about that when I was on the, the Knicks beat, because he was one of the guys kind of at the forefront of that, too, just with the baggy clothes and everything. But it was uh, the league. I mean, that was something that came across, too, in the reporting in the book is just that was part of why they wanted to wash the Knicks out the way they did as far as their playing style is that. We've got women and children watching this. They can't be, we can't be knocking Michael Jordan to the floor. We can't do that. You know, that it was essentially what they would tell me. And they would kind of own it. They said, look, we weren't doing that to the Knicks. Maybe the Knicks were at the forefront of what we were trying to get rid of, but it wasn't. I mean, we were more worried about teams trying to copy the Knicks and everybody trying to do that. And it's Bullshit. Like, <laughs> well, this is where you as a fan versus me. I'm just, I'm just reporting the facts. I'm just the message. That ain't a fact. <laughs> I'm just, the, the I'm next, just reporting the message. The, Maybe not the uh, fact. Fact is different from message. True. You know, you know words. I, I, I know you teach your students, your girls, <laughs> students that. So yes. oh, come on now. The Knicks were targeted. 
And I, I don't think it's funny. I, I thought the league was gonna no, no, we were never doing that. They didn't what? even they didn't even bother. I thought that's what they were going to say. They didn't really run away from that characterization. What they said, and I actually think it makes sense. And Doc Rivers and a couple other guys from that era said it made sense to them. They didn't like it, but they basically said we don't want the league to become more. We don't want the balance to become more about physicality and toughness than we do about skill and athleticism. So what they, about the, the, the Detroit Pistons, the bad boys? They went three rings. They did. They had. They had. But let's let's not get it twisted. They had a lot of talent too. I mean, obviously they did. Isaiah. Next to that talent? They did. And no, I don't think they had as much. We we could we could have the where, conversation. Where did the bad boys come from? What does that mean? The 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 name? The nickname? Right? Yes. I'm bad. The, the the piss was known for their physicality. No, no, I'm not nobody's denying that. I'm saying they had a lot of talent to go with it. That's all I'm saying. I mean they had a couple Hall of Famers to go with it, is all I'm saying. The Knicks had Patrick, we know that. Everybody else, you had Mace, you had Oak, you had Starks. You had one guys that were all star one time. Isaiah, who else is a Hall of Fame? Dumars. Yeah, I mean Dumars was a bad man. He was, he was, he was good. And Michael said for years that that was the guy that he said him, and I think he said Rolando Blackman. Interestingly enough, which I never really thought of him that way, but as what guys that were tough for him just to get around and score on and stuff like that. But Dumars was bad. He was a good guy. Defensively, he was nice. He was nice. So. I, so I, I do make that difference, but I did think it was interesting that Riley, there were some people that came in thinking Riley's going to come in and make this Showtime East. And I mean, we can look in hindsight, they didn't have the personnel to do all that. But defensively, he said, look, I'm not all that mad at what the Pistons were trying to do. Like that strategy kind of works. They might be a little too old to carry it out, but that might be our best shot too. We've got some, we've got some guys that can be bullies and we've got a, a little bit of offense. We got Patrick, we can work around that. I don't know. I would use the term bully. I mean, they were a physical team. Yeah. You know, and, and the physicality was to wear down and, and, you know, make the other teams not, you know, be not wanting to go to the hoop. At all. At all. Even you know? Michael sometimes. <laughs> he didn't want to. He didn't want none of that. The, the Knicks didn't want to in practice. They were going to start said, I'm not going in there. That's one of the first pages of the book. He said, I saw I saw the first couple of minutes of practice. I said, mm, I'm not going in there. They would rather shoot jumpers than go to the hole and get baskets. And, you know, in practice. Right? In practice. Like, yeah, they had to tape up for shoot arounds. Uh Riley was on a different level with that. What what did you what did you feel when he left? Did you kind of feel like it was time? Were you upset that he was leaving? What did you feel as a fan? I just didn't like the way he left. Okay. You know, it was I had been a player on that team for what? He just like he banded the, you know, he, he captain of the ship. Yeah, good team. I mean, best defense in a row, three years in a row. He wanted look, Final four to your boat. Yeah, there was some behind some shaky shit maneuvering behind the scenes. He wanted to get. Ownership, some type of ownership of the team, and there was a thing to go from Western on the Knicks now with Cable Vision coming in, and, and they want to give it to him. So he was like, Yeah, which I can't. And, and, and you know, there was that was it was shaky because he was still in the contract, so you know, he wasn't, wasn't there some joint. Draft, they lost some draft choices and they got fined or something like that. Miami? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, in hindsight, I think they paid a, 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 a million and they gave up a first. I'm like, if that's all. That was a that's a good trade if you're Miami. You take that trade. I, I, yeah, I but still, I mean, like, there oh, was, the there was like, it should have been more than that. There was yeah. like a million dollars. That's like nothing. I know. The way we think about money and trap compensation is a lot different now, especially for someone of Riley's caliber. Because he was widely viewed. I mean, at that point, Phil had won a couple titles in a row. But I think people could still look at Riley and say, at worst, he's the second best coach in the league, if not the best. I mean, he was the only one that could demand an ownership stake and somebody take him seriously. How many rings did he get? Four. Four. Four as a, as a coach, one as a player. So four there. Almost got one with the Knicks, which I think everybody looked at the Knicks and said, it's maybe not the most talented team. They had a lot of skill. What's that word you said? Almost? Almost. 
It's like that if word you used a minute ago. <laughs> we yeah. almost won. Almost. And that was, I will say this for people that are younger. I, I mean, I'm younger, so I, I wasn't of age, but 94, that's as close as you can get to winning a title without actually doing it. I mean, because they had the, the chance in game six with Starks. Kim Olajuwon blocks that shot. Starks had made six shots in a row leading into the, the end of the, the game on that last play with five and a half seconds left. Akeem gets maybe a fingernail on it to change the trajectory of the shot. Yeah, the cash was cool. He was. He was. I don't blame Star. If I'm Starks and I've made six in a row, I don't blame him for taking that shot. And Patrick had really struggled. Patrick was open. But he Patrick, wasn't, he wasn't. Let's he, be honest. Yep. Yeah. I love Patrick. Georgetown. Yep. But Leishman had his number. He did. That, I think he that's why Starks took that shot. Number. I think that's why Starks took that shot. Because you, when you look at those numbers for the finals, he really struggled. I disagree. Starks taking that shot had nothing to do with Patrick. You just said he has Starks, Starks has hit shot, six shots in a row. I know. That's what I'm saying. He's not thinking about Patrick. You know, he's, I'm hot. I'm taking a shot. That's what I would have done, too. Yeah, but why are you bringing up like that? You'd say that it was Starks was saying that that Patrick wasn't doing well. I, no, not that Stark said that. I'm saying, like you said, Patrick wasn't doing particularly well in that series. He didn't have anything for Hakeem in that series. What? He didn't have anything for Hakeem in that series. Offensively, he just wasn't really getting it done. But it started in college. Yeah, that's it. The final. Yeah. Patrick was. So he's strong. I mean, it, it's tough because he. Look, at the worst, team wasn't. Patrick was the only one that the team did work on. Right. I mean, let's. The team was bad. No matter what, Packers my guy. Yeah. You know, but Keen was a monster. Yeah. How'd you feel about those late nineties teams? Because they were they were in the picture too. They didn't quite get there. They had the shot in ninety seven and then the Miami that whole Miami thing. I imagine all Knicks fans still feel a certain way about that. By that point it was a little different. Yeah, Larry yeah, Johnson. But that's another thing. That that thing definitely could have been the suspensions. Yeah. But Patrick what two one foot over the line and get suspended. Yeah. Did you feel like, uh, in that case, did you feel like the league just was coming down on the Knicks just to prove a point? Probably the most Knicks fans probably like. He did. Yeah. David Stern. Again, well, God bless him. Here's the thing I wish you brought up in the book. NBA headquarters is in New York. So they really have to do more to show the rest of the league that they're not, you know, give prep to the Knicks. And they were complicated things with the Knicks getting Pat Ewan and number the first time they ever have the lottery. Right. Haven't won the lottery since then either. And they've been in the lottery a lot of times since then. <laughs> So yeah, the first time it's a lottery, Dave the Busher pulls out the thing and Patrick's name. Mm -hmm. And I don't want to get into it. Because Mr. DeBush is not here. None of them are my guys. Right. But they took a lot of the lead, took a lot of flack for that. So it seemed to me they bent over backwards sometimes to show they were not favoring the New York Knicks. Because they're both from, I mean, they're both from the offices is blocks away from that square garden. Right. And New York City is the biggest market. Right. So I think they overcompensate. And the Knicks, you know, or the brunt of those decisions. Yeah. Were you telling us that we've got some questions that we're going to take from online? Yes. Yes. So we do have some audience questions. Our first one is from Barry Goldberg, who asks, who was to blame for the Pat Riley resignation, Riley or the Knicks? We tend to rightfully blame Knicks ownership for a lot these days, but it also seems like the same type of mismanagement and ownership instability played a role in the fallout. Well, they take you one second. He wrote the book. <laughs> I'm gonna put that on my profile. I wrote the book, so people can't question me on the last thing. Um, my honest answer to that is, uh, 
I think that Riley, to what Spike said, Riley has to own blame for how it happened. Uh, I think one thing that's overlooked in all this is that the Knicks were corporately owned during those years. And so it wasn't just as easy as saying like, sure, Pat, we'll give you 10% of the team because it was a corporately owned team that had shareholders and uh, board, members. board members. You can't just give away 10% of something that is owned by a corporation. Meanwhile, the, the benefit that the Miami Heat had, Mickey Harrison was coming in by himself, basically him and his family to own the Heat. So if he does want to give away 10%, at this point, it's probably 20% because there was an additional 10% that he had to give Pat over the life of the contract he signed. He could give away 20% of the team. So they could do something that the Knicks couldn't. But Pat, as Spike said, Pat had another year left in his deal. Um, and, you know, in fairness to Pat, I, I think people can understand when you're leaving a team for something that's going to be multiples of what you're paid in New York. People get that. It was just kind of, I think most people, Knicks fans certainly would say, like, a kind of a slimy way that he did it. Um, but I mean, yeah, they gave him hell the first game back in the garden. Yeah, now that, that was another one. He of those got nights. holy hell. Yeah, Caught holy hell. Yeah, there. I, I saw a YouTube video from that night. Michael K. When he was doing stuff with MSG, was interviewing people in the arena. He interviewed a kid, a little kid about this talk. He said, "I think Pat should go to jail." <laughs> it's just like it was. It was ugly. Uh, I didn't realize how ugly that was. But I think Pat owns that part of the blame or has to. The Knicks. Um, I think the Knicks maybe could have been a little bit more aware of what was happening and that recognized that Pat was growing emboldened to look for ownership. How could he know if he was having these meetings just when, when he's not supposed to have them? There would have been no ramifications. True, but... The, uh, the, the buying and the draft picks if this, if this, if this, if this shit was legit. No, no, good, good point. So maybe not, but I, I don't know. I, I feel like they didn't write off Pat wanting ownership, but I think the, the tone in which he was asking for it should have signaled it something's happening. Maybe they could have, if they had caught wind of it before, maybe they can completely nip that possibility in the bud before it happens. I, my honest take, and I don't know if I told you this other day, hang out. I don't think Pat could have lasted much longer as the coach anyway. I think he was going to need to move into management or something because he was, he was burning himself out as far he as just burning the players out. he was burning the players out. Now I, now, I think they missed him when he was gone. Like his first game back, the crowd wasn't having Pat, but Patrick and Harper and Starks would go hug the guy on the side. So there were guys, and they missed his style of coaching, but Pat was burning himself out in a way that I don't think, particularly in New York with the media and everything, it didn't feel like he was going to last as a coach. Maybe ownership or a piece of ownership would have changed that, but what happened? All right. Our next question is from Victoria, who starts off saying, congrats, Chris. Thank you. So excited to read the book. Who was the hardest interview to secure, or what was the most surprising thing you learned in the interview? Uh, the most surprising thing, so I don't feel like anybody was particularly hard. Some of the people that were hardest to secure were the people that were like worked as secretaries and people that worked behind the scenes because they're like, why the, how the hell did you get my number 30 years later? And these aren't people that are like public people. So they're like, how'd you get my number? Are you a real person? Who are you? Uh, so I had to, you know, I, I put in uh, acknowledgments that, um, there were they, people that used to work for an organization were starting like Facebook groups to basically talk privately about like, is this guy legit? Is he just looking for dirt? How did your conversations with him go? And so I had to work to build people's trust. Some of the lower level people in this book, but I appreciate that they, they grew to trust me. Um, the, the hardest detail to uncover, maybe not the hardest, I think the most interesting one, we, we were talking about this a little bit, um, that I don't think had been out there, maybe just people knew it privately, was the idea that uh, Starks had the really rough game seven where he shot two for 18 in 94. And essentially one of the people Pat could have subbed in in that situation was Rolando Blackman. Uh, he didn't, and nobody knows why he didn't. You know, Pat has never gone on record specifically saying- Oh, I'll didn't. tell you why. Why? Rolando Blackman had promised his wife that the Knicks make the playoffs that she come where the, the, the series was in the game six and seven were in Houston. Mm -hmm. And Pat Riley told the team why it's hard and ball. Right. And I don't know what happened, but Alonzo's wife did not come. 
and therefore there were some discussions and Pat, Patrick made the decision he was not going to play Rolando Black right. and Rolando Black told me he told me this to his face that he felt that he could hit some shots and make the Knicks have won game seven and that would have been the third the next championship. championship. Right. Right. So to me, that was the. But, but, you, but in the book, you say, what does Patrick, I mean, what, what, what did Riley say about that? Riley, he, he's called it the biggest mistake he ever made. Right. That, well, let's say so. That had come, that happened right away. You, him saying that didn't come right the, away? The, the, no. Oh, I, no, no, no. Not yes. Not no, and I, I think it was one of those things where in the moment, I think he owned it because he was going to be meeting up with Rolando. The the Mavericks years later, what was it, 06, when they played against the Heat in the finals, Pat at that point is still coaching. So he was being asked a lot of things about Rolando because Rolando was on the other sideline. And Pat he was still working. Things. He wasn't playing. Bro. He wasn't playing. He was working for the, the, he was working the front office Mavericks. for the Dallas right. Mavericks. Right. So I, to me, that was probably the, the biggest detail where I was like, oh, you that know that story before? No, no, no. And, and I don't think any, I don't think people outside, the funny thing is, but I think you, maybe you weren't in that circle, but you were in that circle. So the players might tell you stuff. Uh, they're a brother. Yeah, I heard about it. And then I called up a Rambo and said, yo, my brother, blase, 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 blase. So he, he confirmed it. I think, I, I can't remember where I heard about it, uh -huh. but I wanted to talk to Rambo and say, this really happened. And right. he said, he said, Spike, if I played, like I'm not, I'm not from Portland, I can't remember the exact words, but I would have hit some shots. That's basically what he told me. off, and we would, we would have won a world championship. That's essentially what he told me when I interviewed him. So there's still some hard feelings over that. I know uh, a couple of the players I talked to suggested that they all kind of felt like that was a factor. And it's interesting because in my mind, I don't necessarily see it that way that that's exactly why it could have been. But the fact that, to me, the reason I included it in the book. Well, the reason why we're wrong, the black would not play. He hadn't played the rest of the series either. So that's all I'm saying is like, unless it's something where he's really putting his foot down saying like, you're never playing again. I, to me, it's feasible. He wasn't playing that much. He wasn't so much a part of the rotation anyway that like he absolutely benched him because of that. But he could have. And in that moment, if you're ever going to use a backup, you're going to do it when a guy is shooting two for 18. So I, I would have understood. And I could, I, I'm open to the idea that that could have been why. I'm just saying, to me, I didn't, even though I didn't see that as the reason, the fact that the players thought that that's why he might have held Rolando Blackman out because Rolando said, we want to bring our wives, and Pat shut him down and said no. And then Rolando kind of went back at him and said, why not? I, the players thought that. And I, to me, that's more than enough of a reason to include that because they know Pat's mindset better than I do. I mean, I was surprised to read that in the book because, as you said, nobody really knows, you know, that story. People let me in, and I, I I feel grateful that folks trusted this guy. That, like I said, they're like, "Who are you?" You know, and, and I think calling thirty years later, it, it does raise the question of like, "Why are you writing about this now?" But y'all care about this. The fans still care about this stuff a the lot. Players care. The players care. Um, the coaches care. I, I've got that, so many texts from the coaches now. Great documentary, Malice in the Palace, and Reggie Miller's crying. He's like, tears in my eyes. Like. 18 years and this bullshit happened and I don't have I can that team could he said that team he said whoever wins in between Indiana and Detroit is gonna good. win the major and then the Detroit destroyed the league. Mm -hmm. And look, I'm one of these people that I don't think that just because you don't have a wear just because you don't wear a ring, you know, that just destroys your whole legacy. Right. But at the same time. I you know, Pat Pat's my guy. You know, I love him. That's my guy. And and he's I know I Barkley's my guy. And you have these guys who were great and they just whatever reason. Yeah. I know. They, they didn't get it. You know, they didn't call him alone. I know. Stop it. And in my in, in the way I think, I, that does not diminish. You know. How great they are! That's, I mean, you got a lot of bums, you know. Oh, you got people, yeah. you got rakes, people that you know. 
You cleaned that, that up. You cleaned that up real nice. Yeah, they love it. <laughs> they just happen to be on the squad. You know, without reason, they got a ring. Yeah. That's why this book to me, man. It's it's you it's, don't have it's, to, can, can we read the word? This is it. Is this Shakespearean? Uh, Trap. Is it just a oh, tragedy? I thought you meant my book. You mean the story of the Knicks from yeah, the series? Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> I was like, I'm not Shakespeare. I'm, this is my first book. Don't give me all that. Nah. Um, no, I. Well, I mean, you know the literature better than I do. I'm not that sort of writer, but like, I, I don't think that they ever went in. I don't know that they were ever viewed as like the favorite. Maybe once, maybe one year. They didn't fall from that height. I think they had the chance to get it done. And so maybe you could do it. But that even makes it worse where, where you had the chance and Yeah. And then two years Michael was not playing. Yeah. That's when you gotta win. Yeah. The first two times well, they we, went to we, the finals. We, we, we stepped out the second time went to play baseball. Yeah. Look at when they went to the finals, ninety four and ninety nine, immediately after he retired each of those first two times, which tells you how close this team was, but how you really got to make that count, particularly in 94, because I don't think they're going to win 99 without Patrick going up against Twin Towers and oh, David exactly. Robinson and Tim Duncan. You're not going to win that. But 94, they had a legit chance. Even with Patrick not playing particularly well, they almost won it. So to me, the reason they're so almost relevant. Almost don't count. It doesn't count. To a lot of people, it does count for this book. And I think the reason it does, I can't think of many teams that changed the course of the way the game was played more than this team did given that they did not win the title. Like to me, and it, I said it to someone on the podcast the other day, they looked at me like I was crazy. I said, I think this team changed, dictated the way basketball would be played far more than the Bulls did. Now the Bulls were the favorites. They were the best team, the best player. They're the team that's gonna be, you know, exalted in history. We get that, and then and, and they should be. No one's taking that away from them. But this team, they, they, all, they, they changed a ton of the rules because they could not have this in the sporting world. They, they decided we can't have this. We don't want this. And I mean, they, you know, they, they got them out the paint. Who's, who's dead? The league. I mean, they, they, they own it. I mean, the association, the association. Uh, and whether it's because of what you were saying about the idea of like, we can't, you know, we got to keep a distance from the Knicks so that people don't think that we're buddy buddy with them. You know, I, I, I think legitimately, you know, whether you think it's that legitimately, I think that they said the league is getting ugly in a way that we don't want it to, as far as the physicality. We don't want someone to get hurt. We don't want Michael to get hurt, whether it was protecting him. I do think there was a lot of that. And I do think the Knicks were at the forefront of that, but they're the last, they, 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 I, I've described them as these hard hat wearing prehistoric dinosaurs, basically, because you're not going to see that again. It, it, it literally that you might as well put them in a museum. You're not going to see that again. If you blow on somebody, you get <laughs> three months to get a foul right. today. Right. By the way, being at the game with you the other night, man, seeing you work the officials, <laughs> you talking to the players, it's like an out of body experience being there with you. Wow, what was I saying? <laughs> what were you not saying to the ref, bro? <laughs> was I yelling? I wasn't yelling. I wouldn't say you were yelling. Yeah, you probably would have yeah, yelled if they'd been with it. They were down 20, so I don't think that it, <laughs> you didn't have to be as passionate about it because they were down by so much. If it had been a, a one possession game, maybe. <laughs> but uh, um, I had a blast writing about this. I, I'm in awe of uh, how much you cared about it. It surprises me that you, not that you care about it, but that you reached out and that you do an event with me on short notice. Um, uh, thank you for writing the book. I, I couldn't be more grateful. Man. Everybody buy this book. <laughs> Come on now. And I think we can wrap with just one final question. Sure. And it's from Patrick who says, Chris, I love your work. One of my favorite things is your ability to find the quirky stories surrounding the game like Mello's on-court cussing or bats at Spurs games. What's the quirkiest story you heard writing this book? The quirkiest story I heard writing Remember, the book. Remember, there might be some children. Yeah. Watching. Yeah. I had to think about that just writing the book. I'm like, I gotta keep it age appropriate. Um, the quirkiest story I heard, it was one that wasn't true. I've, I've told this a few times. Did I, did I tell you about this? Um, I, I was so excited because I- you tonight? Uh -huh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I'm a political science major and um, a history buff. I really care about that stuff. 
And someone told me, someone high up told me, um, the Knicks were in the middle of a, a long home winning streak, like 20 game home winning streak. And Richard Nixon was coming to a game. He wanted to take his grandson to a game the year before Richard Nixon passed. So I think this was 93. Um, so Nixon's there, but the Knicks lose. And, you know, before the game was over, the Knicks, the Knicks do this now, but where they get a big celebrity there, you know, in that case, a former president. They say, we really want you to come to the locker room, come take pictures with our players, come talk to our players. They do that sort of thing now. You see that now a lot. Um, so Nixon comes into the locker room, but the team is kind of like not in the greatest mood because they just lost for the first time in half a season at home. Uh, Patrick Ewing is well known. Any reporters, people that, you know, they can get in the locker room would always sit there with his legs out, stretching his legs, but he'd have his feet in ice. Uh, you know, bucket. Buck, big bucket of ice, you know, uh, ice packs on his knees. Uh, and so he gets up. I mean, it's a process for Patrick to get up because he's such a big man. Uh, Nixon's there. He's getting up to kind of, you know, to pay respect to the former president, the disgraced president. Tricky dick. Tricky dick. So he gets up <laughs> and Patrick apologizes to the former president. This is the way the story's told to me. I'll explain that in a minute. He gets up and he says, we're really sorry. We normally perform much better than this. We're really sorry we couldn't get it done for you today since you're here in attendance. It was you know, special to have you here. <laughs> Richard Nixon grabs Patrick by the shoulder and says, you don't have to apologize for anything, Patrick. Uh, but in the future, if you can't beat him, just cheat. And uh, so I, my eyes get real big when I get that anecdote in my interview. And I'm like, oh, really? Um, so as soon as I'm off the phone with this person, I, you know, I, on my computer, I'm firing up Google because again, I'm a political scientist. I'm like a history person. So I'm like, I'm thinking, and I'm also thinking like, not necessarily dollar signs, but like the interest in the book is going to be broader than basketball at this point, because like you have a president that essentially had to step down because of dishonesty and cheating and different stuff like that. Uh, and he's like, it, he's telling a player and a team to cheat, like obviously in jest, but still like that's an incredible revelation. It took me all of five minutes, maybe 10 to debunk the fact that it ever happened because Richard Nixon only went to one game. You look in the media reports, there's only one game. Um, and the Knicks won that game by like 25 points against the Timberwolves. So I was really sad when it wasn't true because <laughs> I was thinking, I was like ready to build a whole chapter around that. Uh, not really, but uh, that would have been really quirky, really funny. It would have been a great history note to have in there. And like I said, it probably would have been interesting to a different audience, but it also was a good lesson to really vet every single thing that everybody was telling me. And um, even though it was a really prominent person in the organization that had told me that, I asked him, I said, where'd you get that from? Because I'm looking it up. I didn't see that. He's like, oh, I could have sworn somebody told me. I was like, well, you didn't see this happen? So again, a really good lesson. And uh, when you talk to 200 some people, You've got to be really careful about well, I mean, you have to be careful about taking anything that somebody tells you is fact. You just have to investigate it for yourself. So probably the weirdest, quirkiest thing that happened. I wish it had been true, but it wasn't. Well, on that note, thank you so much for such a fantastic event. It's an thank honor you to have us. Spike, thank you for doing this thank with you, me, buddy. I appreciate you. You, you. Thank you. Thank you guys for tuning in. All right, Nick fans, orange, blue skies. Let's go. Have a good night, everyone. Hey, hey.